So I, with that, I want to introduce um, Randall Solomon. He's going to be our moderator for the next portion of the meeting. Uh, we're really lucky to have Randy here. Um, he is one of the principals and co-founders of Sustainable Jersey. Uh, prior to that, he was the executive director of New Jersey Sustainable State Institute at Rutgers, where he worked to expand the capacity of public decision making to address sustainability. He writes and speaks frequently on sustainable development, land use policy, using indicators and public decision making and governance issues. And welcome, Randy. Thank you. Hey, Heather, yes. Can you just leave the yes, let me hold on. One second, folks, I will. <coughs> How does that look? There we go. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, Sustainable Jersey and the Citizens Campaign have an amazing partnership because we share a really common kind of value and root, and that is a belief that we can empower citizens and communities to take on our most pressing challenges. And they see the lack of information about what's going on in the world um, and empowering people to also have an impact in government and uh, uh, help government when it needs it and sort of a kick in the pants when it needs it as being central to solving a lot of our big challenges. And in Sustainable Jersey, we're trying to help the 565 small, mostly small local governments in New Jersey that oftentimes don't have a lot of capacity um, deal with really big issues like recovering from massive uh, natural disasters or dealing with issues like global warming or redevelopment. They don't always have capacity. And so in our program, we're trying to empower community groups, local green teams, and volunteers and enable the local governments to partner and harness these volunteers to start to address these problems that they probably can't do on their own. Um, and it really actually speaks to one of the reasons why we need citizen journalism. Because um, if you are a local green team and you're trying to, for example, get attention for the fact that you just launched a new program that, for example, is going to help everyone make their homes more energy efficient um, and insulate them, and you have your big announcement where you announce your program and there's no reporter there, um, how's anyone going to know about your program? How are you ever going to be effective in getting people throughout your community to engage with your programs? So um, we ha um, I want to give one brief anecdote um, on why this is so important. And, and I used to live in New Brunswick a, a number of years ago. And I, just to check it out, came to a city council meeting once. And there was a development that was going through uh, that I had heard nothing about. Um, and it got approved that night. And before it got approved, there were uh, a, a couple of people that made an impassioned plea against this development, um, and mostly on global warming and walkability grounds. They said this, would, this is in the wrong place. It's the wrong type of development. It's not pedestrian friendly. And um, the council sort of thanked them for their comments. And uh, there was no reporter there. So no one except the three people in the room ever heard about this. Had I not been there, I never would have heard about it. And after I left that room, I never heard about it again. Um, and this is New Brunswick. What about Highland Park and, and Piscataway and all the other little communities around there? So the need for, for citizens to play an active role in helping people understand what's going on in government and what's going on in the world around them as the big newspapers um, and uh, and you know, sort of decline, and few and fewer professional reporters are showing up at, at small council meetings, as you talked about, is uh, incredibly important. So to talk about this issue tonight, we have a great panel. Um, we have Justin Asiello, who's almost becoming like a folk hero on the internet um, for uh, his uh, tremendous uh, um, Facebook page, Jersey Shore Hurricane News. And I think we all heard the stories of people who were sort of twittering um, emergency services during Hurricane Sandy saying, I've got nothing except my Twitter account, come pick me up. Well, he, he, um, he tried to make that work in a little more systematic way, and so we'll hear about that. Um, we have uh, Colleen O'Day from New Jersey Spotlight, and she does an amazing job of taking complex abstract issues based on data 
and then distilling it into graphics that really make um, these abstract issues understandable. And um, Mike Lamonic, who is from Climate Central, and they, um, um, they have an incredible challenge of trying to explain to the world why global warming is really happening. Um, and after Sandy, maybe it's not quite as hard as it was before Sandy, but even so, I mean, these are complex, abstract issues, um, and getting people to understand them and act on them is a challenge. And it's a challenge for reporters to figure out how to report on them. So um, first, I'm, I'm going to, um, in a second, call up uh, Justin Asiello, and I'm going to read your bio so people get a sense of who you are when you're not Facebooking. Is that what you do, Facebook? You know. That's what, that's what my wife tells me, right? Why are you Facebooking again? <laughs> and I'm like, no, it means something. Uh, it's important. Uh, so um, he's founder and editor-in-chief of Jersey Shore Hurricane News. Um, it's a real-time breaking news site housed on Facebook. By day, he's an urban planner uh, with Cafone Consulting Group, where he provides diverse planning services to both public and private clients and also serves as the director of technology. He's got extensive experience in master planning, redevelopment, zoning, analysis, urban design, affordable housing, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that a planner would do. Um, and he's also a new media consultant, and obviously he knows what he's doing there. So, Justin. Hi everyone, I'm, uh, I'm Justin Osiello. Um, it's, it's great to be here and uh, you know, great to speak about uh, what I've been doing in, in this realm uh, since August uh, 2011. Uh, I've always been fascinated by news when, when the fire alarm uh, for you know, my local fire department would go off as a kid, I'd get on my bike and I'd try to chase down the fire truck. So I've always been kind of a news hound. Uh, when Twitter um, started to get big in 2007, I, I hopped on pretty early and I started to get into, I started to see how valuable uh, social media was uh, on, on how people can report uh, what, you know, what's going on around them. And then I, I started to write about new media and the intersection between new media and urban planning and trying to find the, the parallels and, and, and um, you know, how both of them can work together. I started blogging about the need for government 2.0, meaning we need more government access. We need people to come to meetings, to, to blog about meetings, to, to write um, you know, Twitter updates, et cetera. So how this came uh, uh, about, that's kind of the, the, the background on how I, I got to this point where I wanted to kind of create uh, this, uh, this news outlet uh, where, where, where people can, can, can communicate and report news uh, as it's happening. And that kind of happened a few days before Hurricane Irene, um, in, um, in 2011, uh, I, I started to realize that um, I'm, a, I'm a resident of, of South Seaside Park, and there were a lot of rumors going around. A lot of people were panicking. Uh, people were afraid that they weren't going to have any information as the storm w was progressing. Media in New Jersey, we don't really have a, a lot of experience in covering uh, these massive storms. So I said, you know what, I want to create uh, this service where people are going to be able to report uh, what's going on around them. And I, I, had, I had years already of, of doing this, so I had trained myself on how to be a journalist, on, on a, as Heather pointed out, on, on, on how to do proper sourcing uh, and, and, not, and, and obviously not to run with rumor and, you know, to, to vet everything and, and also to present in a proper way. So Irene came and, and this became, this exploded and went to 30,000 likes, which I don't call people who like the page likes. They're, they're my contributors. They're part of the news gathering team. And I've tried to press that ethos from the start to let people know that you're not just a, a like, you're, you're someone who adds to the conversation. So after Irene, uh, after I, um, you know what, I should probably, so this is, uh, this is the Facebook page, as you can see. This is the, the Twitter feed. Um, and essentially, Irene, this was a, um, a, a breaking news. As the storm was coming in, people were reporting what was going on around them, and I was serving as the filter to either get information from official sources or um, you know, to, you know, to basically get that information out to the masses, information that was vetted and, and accurate. After the storm had passed, started to turn into an effort, uh, you know, uh, people, I, I need this, I need that, where can we get it? And the community really started to kind of gel at that point. After Irene, it, 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 it transitioned into a, 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 a daily news traffic and weather uh, platform, all in real time. This right here is a, a photo 
a report from, this was one of kind of the, the major watershed moments. This was uh, February 13th of uh, 2012. This was the big fire in, in, in Long Branch. And this was kind of like the first major story um, that the community all kind of, you know, chipped in uh, to help uh, report. This was a, a photo that I had found on, on Twitter, but other people had sent in photos and videos and, and information. Uh, this, is a, this is kind of a, another thing that I do. This is, a, this is all kind of, you know, crowdsourced uh, a traffic report. Um, people send in information that there's something going on in the parkway. Um, and then I take that information, I look at cameras, I confirm whether that's happening or not, and then I get information from the official sources, and I also um, get information from, from the people on the ground, which I, which I vet. Uh, so, fast forward to Sandy, kind of, I, I guess the reason why I'm here is because this service exploded um, in the days uh, before uh, Sandy and in the days after. It went from, I think there were 66,000 contributors um, a few days before Sandy, and then the day after uh, the storm had, had, co had come through and passed, there were, I believe, 180,000 contributors. So this literally just exploded overnight. And this was a, a report, I was, um, during the whole storm, I, was just, I, I didn't sleep for days. Um, my girlfriend was very concerned about my health. Um, she said, please go to sleep, please. I said, I can't, because this is a platform, this is what makes it interesting. This is a, a, a platform that's based upon social media, but it's not kind of, it's not operating in this uncontrolled fashion. You've probably heard the story on Twitter, where there was a, a gentleman uh, in, um, well, I wouldn't really call him a gentleman for what he did, but there was someone in, in New York City who was posting all this false information, and it was causing this public panic. Uh, and it caused a lot of problems for, for first responders. But what, the way I operate it is that everyone is a contributor, but it doesn't get post into the main feed uh, unless that's been vetted by me. So that's kind of my role as the filter. Uh, someone who, who, who is not going to, uh, you know, who is not going to publish this information unless it's true. So, Governor Christie, um, this was an urgent message. He was telling people to get off the Barrier Island. Um, they had their last chance at, um, at low tide, three in the afternoon that day. And uh, people, people were receptive, and a lot of people said to me, you know what? I left after I saw this. A lot of people didn't even have radios. It's unbelievable. People, their own, people's only source of information was coming from social media. This is the uh, photo of, of Casino Pier. I had friends who had stayed on the island, and they had sent me, this was one of the first images that the world saw of the uh, a roller coaster sitting in the ocean. Um, this was the um, day after I was getting a lot of people saying, I'm trapped. I have no way to get out. And I'd say, call 911. Well, I can't get through to 911 because uh, they're overloaded. Ocean County uh, Sheriff's Department 911, they could not handle all of the requests for help. So I had been working with uh, New Jersey OEM, the state police, prior to uh, Sandy. They, had, they called me in after Irene, and they wanted to know me. They you know, wanted to meet me because they, they wanted to say, you know, in the future, we want to collaborate because you have, you have all these people that are listening. So New Jersey OEM was monitoring, and people were giving, I'm saying, post your address. OEM would say, okay, um, you know, we, we've, we've notified first responders in your area. So through this mechanism, people were able to get rescue. This was another thing. Uh, we transitioned from kind of the news to the aftermath. Uh, where can we find ATMs, gas, food, ice, et cetera? People, this was all crowdsourced. People were providing the information in real time. So instead of having to drive around forever, you can just come here and you can find uh, what you needed. Shelter needs, this was another big thing. Obviously, Ocean and Monmouth County, the shore area, shelters um, had, had, a, had, a, had a huge need. And people through this, people were able, and one thing I should, I should say too, the way this works is, say you want to get this out to your friends, you share it. And then everything can go viral very, very fast. This is uh, one, one mechanism that, that, that I used um, to, to stop rumors. People, um, one of the reasons why I, I, I refused to sleep was because I, I wanted to control rumors that m people may have posted on the wall. Now again, everyone can't see that wall. You can only see that if you visit the page, the, the sidebar page itself. The, they will only see information that I post, but I was nonstop deleting rumors. I got, I got to the point where I was saying to people, don't post anything inaccurate, send it to me privately. And within minutes, my inbox, private inbox, was filled with messages from people because they wanted to, they wanted to tell someone what the rumor was. 
And there were some unbelievable rumors that were circulating, um, but I, I wanted to control it. We, we transitioned uh, even further. Obviously, we're still doing, we're, you know, we're still dealing with the, the, the Sandy story, but this was a plaque that was found on Veterans Day of a veteran from World War II. I posted, posted it and five minutes, people shared five minutes later, his daughter claimed it and said, I can't believe we spent all day in Spring Lake trying to find this. This is my dad's plaque. It got washed away in a, um, you know, during the storm from a bench. So now we're, we're, I'm still doing the, 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 the citizen journalism, news traffic, and whether people are, are providing the information and I'm serving as the filter, but we've, we've transitioned um, a lot to the Sandy recovery in, 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 uh, in, um, in, in you know, covering uh, that, that side of the story. Um, obviously, it's still ongoing. I'm a resident of the shore and I, I live it every day. And um, people are submitting photos, people are submitting videos, people are, are writing up their own reports. Um, because, quite frankly, everyone wants to be part of this. Everyone loves to see their photo. Everyone loves to see what they've written. Um, and um, and it's, been, it's been a phenomenal thing. Um, and people, it's not so much a media outlet, it's also a community forum. Through commenting, people are, are able to share their stories. People are able, you know, to, uh, you know, to share what they're going through. Um, and, the, and just one last thing, too, it, it's not so much that. I, I try to have, a, uh, you know, a, you know th this educational component make people aware of what's going on, what, what type of animals we have in New Jersey. This is a seal, and, and people don't even, people, a lot of people don't realize that we have seals here. Um, and so I, I you know, try to provide that information to people, and, and, and people are stunned. So just to, so in a nutshell, essentially, this is a, I, I, I like to say it's a bottom-up, two-way uh, news platform. And it's kind of maybe redundant. You say, why do you say bottom-up and two-way? Well, I say bottom-up because the ethos is about the people. This is, this is news for the people by the people. Uh, it's two-way because I'm the one who, who serves as the filter. I'm the one who, who, who serves to basically create these stories and put them together and make sure that they're accurate. But without the people, uh, this, this doesn't exist. W with, you know, because we need, because I need the contributors to, you know, to report uh, you know, what's going on uh, around them. And it's been, it's been, it's been very successful. And um, I'm, just, I'm just, people say to me, you're not making money doing it. They say, you're, 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 you're nuts. You're doing this just, just for free. And I'm like, well, I, I'm doing it uh, because I, I, I believe that New Jersey needs a platform where people can, can be well informed in a, uh, in a fair and accurate way. Working towards the, the funding, but that's another story for another day. So thank you. Thanks, Justin. We'll take questions at the end after all three panelists have gone. Um, so next is Colleen O'Day. She's editor-at-large at New Jersey Spotlight. And if you don't uh, read New Jersey Spotlight, you should. It's uh, quickly becoming a very important news venture, um, sort of new media news outlet. She's a lifelong New Jersey resident. And she spent her entire career reporting news in New Jersey, covering topics that include politics, state government, education, environment, and development. Politics, right. Um, most recently, she handled computer assistant re assisted reporting for the Daily Record of Parsippany. And she's freelanced for a number of New Jersey and national publications and has won numerous state and national journalism awards. Um, but she's here tonight because of her expertise in data, ju data journalism uh, through interactive mapping on topics such as the Sandy monetary damages and post-Sandy power outages. Um, and Colleen, would you come up? All right. Hi. So uh, thanks. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, just as uh, Heather was talking about journalism and kind of the five W's of journalism, I'm kind of going to get a little bit into um, that discussion when we talk about uh, data journalism for everybody. Um, you know, so just a little bit, as uh, my background was discussed, I used to be a news, you know, print reporter uh, with the Daily Record, and as life progressed and things changed, I kind of taught myself some data journalism skills, and now um, with the decline of many papers, the Daily Record being one of them, we've got like 
we, we're not we anymore. It's not two years I haven't been we. But the paper has about three reporters left out of a staff of 21 when I started there. So um, I'm now uh, a, um, you know, an online journalist, and I've kind of had to, again, teach myself new skills. And this is all stuff that you guys, trust me, if I can learn how to do it, you guys can do it. Um, so the first W is the who. Now, if there's any Star Trek fans out there, this is my really bad joke, data from the second generation. <laughs> but who is, is you? Everybody. Everybody can do data journalism today. Um, and what? E everything. I mean, there, there's kind of nothing out there that I can think of that doesn't lend itself to some sort of number of statistics. You know, as, as Heather pointed out, the more that you can um, substantiate information, you know, be it with real stats, with real numbers, um, that's going to give you more credibility. It's also going to help the people who are, you know, who, who are reading you, who you're trying to get information out to. So some stuff that you guys, you know, depending on what your beat is, what you're covering, uh, budget breakdowns for, you know, schools and municipalities, test scores, again, for schools. Everybody loves to see what the test scores are. Um, toxic sites, if you're an environmental site, or again, if you're a municipal site. Um, affordable housing units, gosh, that's a huge issue in the state of New Jersey, despite the fact that everything's kind of in a lull at the moment. Um, the census now every year comes out with new estimates down to the town level, even your tiny town. Um, great source of information. Uh, who's getting tax breaks in town? You know, there was a report out today on how the uh, Christie administration has given, um, it's, I think, about $2 billion plus in tax breaks just, you know, since the start of the administration um, in things like, um, you know, uh, real estate uh, tax right on um, abatements and, and the like. Um, S Sandy statistics, you know, as, as Justin was just saying, I mean, it's, a, it's just a huge story and it's not going away anytime soon. So if you're at all at the shore or have a community, even in Bergen County, that was affected, people want that kind of information. Um, and, you know, you can get to other things, too. Use that Oprah. Cell phone bills. Who in town hall has a cell phone? And how much, you know, are taxpayers paying for it? All that kind of stuff makes for great stories. Um, again, now where? Where do you get it from? Everywhere. It's the same thing. Uh, New Jersey State Government has some great um, sites. There's the, more, the Your Money site, uh, State Police, Department of Ed, Department of Community Affairs, Department of Transportation, Department of Environmental Protection. You got the whole alphabet soup here, health. You name it, it's probably there. There's numbers somewhere. Um, the federal government, again, you've got the same kinds of, uh, kinds of places, education, um, HUD for housing stats, CDC for health stats, the Small Business Administration, that's just your general loans, but also their Sandy loans. Um, uh, FEMA should be up there. God. Well, you know why I didn't put FEMA there? Because they are so bad about releasing information. Anybody who's trying to get Sandy data, boy, good luck, because I know we're trying, like everybody else. Um, the EPA, there's a FedStat site, so there's lots of places there. Again, Census Bureau. Um, and then you can get information from other sources, public interest groups um, today, like New Jersey Public Policy put out data. Um, uh, your municipal clerk, your school business administration, uh, administrator, your planning board, all sorts of officials like that. Um, when do you do it? All the time. You can do it now, tomorrow, the next day. I mean, there's there's always numbers out there that, that you know, are going to be of interest to folks. Um, obviously, there's some that, you know, come at certain times, budget time, obviously, you're going to want to look at that when the report card comes out for test scores. But, you know, if you're just looking for um, one of the things we do at Spotlight is we have this map of the week. So once a week, I kind of troll around on the internet if there's nothing um, that's, you know, just jumping out at me to find something to put up. So there's always, you know, you can just kind of create a little storehouse for that. And why? Again, to, to kind of um, provide proof and validity to, to stories. Um, you know, it's that, it's that sourcing. Um, it, makes, it makes your, um, your reporting seem more, more real. Um, to keep officials honest, because we should never, ever just take an official's word 
for granted. Um, you know, and, and even numbers can be skewed. So, you know, what I can say is a 2% increase. Well, it may be a 2% increase in one category, but, you know, overall it's going to be 6%. So you really need to check, you know, check their math and, and um, you know, make them, make sure that uh, they're telling you the truth. Um, everybody's nosy, right? Everybody wants to know. I mean, we, you know, we put up some, uh, some individual point information on, um, energy efficiency grants, which tells you who, who's gotten them. And boy, people click on those like crazy because you want to see in your town, hey, who's getting, you know, who's getting money? It's just, we, we are, we're nosy. Um, you can tell richer stories with numbers because again, you've got some, you know, you have some detail. You can, you can put things into perspective. Um, you can see trends that might otherwise be hidden and, and the maps that we do are a really good way to do that because you can look and suddenly see patterns of color. Um, Oh, yeah, geez, I, you know, look at, obviously, Sandy, there's more, you know, there's more impact along the shore, but you can even see when you map that kind of stuff, what parts of the shore were, were hit better, so, so, were hit harder, so, so you can, you can really see trends. Um, you know, we always uh, used to say um, in journalism, show me, don't tell me. It's a good, it's a good rule for writing. You know, don't, don't just say something, but, but kind of be descriptive and, you know, that's, that's the mark of a good writer. Well, um, with data you can both show and tell, you know, you can, you can do both. Um, numbers make things more interesting and, uh, in terms of our maps, people really do like to see those kind of pretty colors out there. Um, and the H is the how, right? That's, we have the five W's, but there's an H. Um, so here's that sandy damage map that we did that got uh, an incredible amount of traffic because people, are, again, are really interested in this, um, in this story. Um, so we do a lot of work with Google, and I'm, I'm saying here Google is your friend, and it's free. Um, you can use Google Docs just to store information. You can use it to, to write stories. Um, you can create tables, you can create spreadsheets, or you can download spreadsheets and work with them in that, depending on what software you have at home. Uh, you can create charts and put them up. It is, it's, I mean, it's amazing. It's all free. So here's a, um, a chart that we did recently. We did a story on um, what's happened to uh, college tuitions. And this shows you for New Jersey the um, average full-time tuition and fees in state for county colleges, state colleges, and Rutgers. You've got all the years with the nice colors uh, and that little bubble that comes up that says state colleges, that appears when you click on it. So it's an interactive chart. All I had to do was put this in a Google spreadsheet and you know, spend a few minutes learning how to do this and you can create an embed code that you can stick in your WordPress site or whatever your, your website is. It's just, it's really easy. Um, uh, same, same story, we had another, this is another kind of chart you can do. Again, when you click on any, anywhere on this line, this little um, bubble will pop up. So it makes it interactive. It gives people a reason to, you know, to be looking around. Um, you can also embed a spreadsheet onto your site. So here is the uh, energy efficiency uh, grants that I was talking about. So again, I put this spreadsheet online. Um, I tried to com um, compact it as much as possible. Uh, you're still going to have to scroll along the bottom if you see, but uh, you can put this now on your site and people can look I, at, you know, who's gotten uh, how much money, uh, when did they get it, what's the address. You can do this with anything. You can do it with your test scores. You can do it with the budget. You can put up anything that you know, you want in this manner. Um, this is more of a table that I created. Uh, we did a, another map on health, um, <coughs> excuse me, on which are the healthiest counties. And this shows you for um, what happens is when you click on that map, it's going to take you to a county. And this is, these are the, um, the various measures that were made. And so, again, now somebody clicks on the map, then they can click on the link and they find out, wow, look at all this information about my county. Um, and then the, the, what we use for the mapping is Google Fusions ta Fusion tables. And again, it's free. It's very similar to using a spreadsheet. It's, it's right there online. Um, and it creates, you know, the, you, you really get a lot of control over it, colorful map. Uh, this one was farmland assessment. So we did two things with this map. Number one was we mapped the percent of property um, that is in farmland assessment by town uh, from zero to more than 50%. Uh, 
of uh, figuring green, you know, using green would be a good way to measure more farmland. And then the pink dots on it are actual locations. So if you click on the one, this is my favorite, in Colts Neck, well, it's Bruce Springsteen's property. And boy, I would, you know, it's kind of my... My, my hometown guy. But you can see what we, what we did was map a bunch, of, um, a bunch of fairly famous or b large properties. Bon Jovi's property is on there. Um, Christine Todd Whitman, former governor, her property is on there. So we, you know, we, we put up politicians, you know, all things that, again, because people are interested in this. So you can see how much, um, and you click on any of those, either the towns or the dots, and you'll get some information about that. Um, so, and here's exactly what you see. So when you click on a town here, I chose Stafford Township, you can see the number of parcels, um, the total acres for farming, and you can even in this create a, um, a pie chart uh, that shows, that breaks out. So most of the farmland assessed in Stafford is woodland, wetland, um, and you can see where those break out. Again, really, I mean, really easy. If I can do it, you can do it. Um, Household income, again, this is a different kind of bar chart I put at the bottom, but you can see the uh, percentage of households with income of $200,000 or more. Somerset County, fairly wealthy, those numbers are pretty high. But you can look, because this is um, inflation adjusted, you can see what happened post-recession. Look, look at the, you know, the drop in 09, and it's been kind of working its way back up. Um, and this is a map of toxic chemical releases. Again, this is location by location. So, you know, if you have a town site, I mean, people want to know, right? What's being spewed out around the corner from me or even in the town next door? So you click on it, you can get, um, you know, you can find out what the most uh, released chemicals are. You can get some volumes. And then you click on the link and you can get even more information. Um, there are uh, other tools that you can use depending on your skill level and interest. Um, Tableau Public, Many Eyes, Vidi, QGIS, Free Dive. These are all free tools that you can find online, download to make charts, um, spreadsheets, maps, graphics. Um, some of them take a little bit more, um, you know, uh, there's a little bit of more of a learning curve. But, you know, you got to, you know, take a little time when you have it. I know everybody's really busy. Um, and you know, the, my, my f I guess the tips that I would leave you with are if you don't know about spreadsheets, learn it. You know, you got to take some time to do it. Uh, you can search for help and tips online for all of these kinds of, um, you know, Google's great or any search engine is great. Um, join IRE and NICAR, which is the uh, Investigative Reporters and Editors, and the National Institute of Computer Assisted Reporting, listservs. You can get lots of help from them, I do. Um, be dogged in your pursuit of data. File OPRA requests if necessary, to get information if you get stonewalled. Happens a lot. Um, give yourself plenty of time. Uh, when you're first getting started, uh, try, don't try these things on deadline because you will make mistakes. I still make mistakes, but, you know, that's how you learn. Um, and then I've got here, uh, you know, Heather said this is going to be up there. I have some, uh, some suggestions for links where you could learn more information and, um, you know, find some tutorials on how to do this stuff. So I... Um, uh, and you can always contact me, and I'm happy to help anybody because, like I said, I get a lot of help from, uh, from other folks in the journalism, the data journalism community. So um, I wish you lots of luck. Thank you very much. Um, the, the next panelist, I, I think, is dealing with a very difficult challenge because he's, he's got to figure out ways to communicate on a phenomenon which is something that you cannot see, like a roller coaster in the ocean, uh, and which you don't necessarily have such easy, there's a lot of data, but it's not quite so cut and dry as the type of data that Colleen deals with. And so this is a special challenge for citizen journalists when you have to deal with information that is complex and technical, maybe scientific, and also disputed. Um, and global warming is a hotly disputed issue, although from a scientific perspective, it's not really hotly disputed. It's just disputed in politics and in the media. And I, I first had to deal with this issue, not the issue of global warming, but the issue of how do you deal with um, arguments over complex and technical facts when one side is pretty much right and the other side is pretty much wrong, and a reporter's got to figure out how they're going to report on it. So I, I was at a small town meeting in the town that was dealing with sustainable Jersey, 
And Sustainable Jersey is a program that was put together by the New Jersey League of Municipalities and the State of New Jersey and Rutgers and the College of New Jersey to help local governments um, deal with not just environmental issues, but is issues that manifest over the long term and where you where people really want to preserve their quality of life over the long term. Um, and we have over 380 New Jersey municipalities participating, and none of them have ever had a problem. Um, and at this meeting, someone showed up and said that, uh, no, in fact, everything that I just told you about our program is not true. And in fact, we were in cahoots with the United Nations to institute one world government, and that we were, um, we were, we were communist, and we were trying to institute, um, herd everyone into these eco-fascist concentration camps to preserve land and take away property rights. And I said, well, well, so that's not true. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and he's like, well, you know, uh, it is true. And of course, the 12-year-old the reporter that was in the room um, dutifully wrote down both of our sides and said, one side says, you know, the moon is made of green cheese, and the other side says the moon is made of rocks and minerals. You decide. Um, and I just thought, oh, geez, there has to be a better way. Um, but reporters are in a bind, because on the one hand, they sort of know what they know, and part of what reporters are expected to do is have, um, you know, a BS, BS detector. But on the other hand, they don't want to seem like they're partisan or taking sides in a fight. So um, uh, I don't know if our next panelist will be able to shed any light on that whatsoever, uh, but I, th I think he will. At least he's, he's someone that has to deal with this dynamic. So uh, the next one is uh, Mike, Michael Monick. He's the senior staff writer at Climate Central uh, and a former senior science writer at Time Magazine for nearly 21 years. And while he was there, he wrote more than 50 cover stories on science and the environment. Um, he's also written for publications such as Discover, Scientific American, Wired, New Scientist, and The Washington Post. You've probably heard of a couple of those publications. He's the author of four books and has taught science and environmental journalism at various universities, and he holds a Master of Science in Journalism from Columbia. So we're excited to have Mike here and to share his insights with us. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so um, I'm a little bit of a ringer here because I'm not a citizen journalist. I am an old-fashioned uh, non-citizen journalist, um, although I am a citizen. So, so uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, and, and it's true. I do now work for this, um, uh, this nonprofit called Climate Central, and our mission is, it, it arose a little bit um, for the same reason that, that citizen journalism is gaining so much prominence um, and importance now, which is that uh, the traditional news media are shrinking, laying people off, uh, going out of business. Our, uh, I was at Time for many years. Um, we used to call Newsweek Brand X. Uh, they were our big competitor. Now you can't even buy Newsweek on the newsstand. It's, it's now entirely online and much diminished. So um, as, as traditional journalism outlets disappear, and you've, in fact, you've heard about that um, uh, from earlier speakers, uh, there's a void. Uh, there's an information void, and one way that that can be filled is through citizen journalism. Um, but another way that people are looking at filling that void is through nonprofit journalism. And the idea there is that uh, foundations and other uh, uh, people or organizations with money um, are willing to support journalism um, not in order to make a profit, but simply to get important information um, out to the world. One uh, such outfit is a place called ProPublica, which um, funds investigative journalism, which is, a, is something that's really dying out, uh, mostly because it's so labor intensive and um, takes so much time, and, uh, and news newspapers can afford less and less of it traditional news outlets can afford less of it. And so, um, so foundations have donated to this, this uh, nonprofit and they are publishing important journalism. And uh, in 2008, a group of people who are concerned about climate change as a very important and serious um, problem facing the world and 
noting that uh, that traditional journalism outlets were laying off reporters, including science reporters, felt that there had to be a place to go where news about climate change could be um, uh, could be uh, covered. And uh, and I went to work for that organization. And the idea that we have is to use some of the tools you've heard about, data journalism, for example, um, and in some cases, uh, citizen contributions, but mostly traditional reporting um, to cover this field where not only are, uh, is there less and less coverage, but where the coverage is, as you just heard, so polarized, where there's so much information that is confusing or misleading, so many competing voices, and the need that many journalists still feel, inappropriate though it has become, to give both sides of this story. Um, and so, so that's what we do, and uh, you can see here the, uh, the homepage. Um, we cover international stories about climate. We cover, we'll wait for it to scroll around. I don't know what's coming up next. Um, Oh yeah, uh, so U.S. Dis uh, disaster losses, many of them caused by major uh, weather and climate events. Uh, this is a story I wrote this morning, actually, on uh, a new scientific report showing how global warming combined with agricultural changes in agricultural practices are threatening the water quality in Lake Erie. And um, if you go down here a little further, you can see all sorts of different stories that we've done. And what I'm going to try and do here without missing a beat, I'm not used to the PC format, but oh, there it is. Um, I'm gonna go try and go up to our search box and go to our Hurricane Sandy coverage because that um, last fall was a major um, component of our coverage as well. Uh, we could not uh, be everywhere uh, doing local reporting. We could not do those, some of those local photographs and local reports that you saw, which is, uh, which is an enormous lack. We are a relatively small staff and we may have to talk because um, people who are on the ground talking about conditions, especially in a, in a disaster like that, uh, are immensely valuable um, uh, to an organization like ours. All right. Let's see if I can do this. All right. And, um, and you'll see that we've got lots and lots and lots of stories about Sandy, but this is a climate site, and so while much of what we talked about was was the hurricane itself and the um, uh, and the damage that was being done, um, as we you know, here we go ongoing coverage down here, um, and we tried to keep up with the the actual unfolding events on the ground. Uh, okay, it jumped on me. Um, the um, not talk and chew gum at the same time or walk. Uh, the, um, our main mission is to talk about climate and climate science and what, what is going to happen to our climate in the future. And, uh, and so you can see here in some of these headlines, um, we talk about uh, the risks of Sandy Lake surge events rising in a warming world, uh, the whole question of what the relationship of Sandy to climate change actually is. And here we get into the question of trying to tell the truth. And uh, again, you heard, uh, you heard some talk about that earlier, but I want to emphasize that as a journalist, whether you're uh, a citizen journalist or someone else, uh, someone who does it professionally, um, what you're trying to do is tell the truth. And the problem is that the truth uh, can be elusive and the truth can be complicated and the truth can be something other than what you expect when you go into a story. And I, I think that's something that's really important to emphasize. Many people um, go into a particular story, whether you're professional or, or, uh, or not professional, and you've got an idea of what the story is. You know, they're, the corrupt officials are stealing money from us. Uh, you know, I know it. They always do that. Um, and it may be that you go in and do some reporting and some investigation and find out, no, in fact, it, in this case, nobody's stealing money from you. And that's it is really um, important as a journalist not necessarily to be objective in the sense that you, uh, you heard described before, in the sense that you have to report both sides of every story, because there are not always two sides uh, or, or two legitimate sides to every story, but you do have to be open-minded. You have to go in and 
look at the facts in a, in a particular situation, and evaluate the facts and come to a judgment. And this is something we don't talk about much as, as uh, reporters. We talk about ourselves as though we're some kind of Olympian beings who, who, uh, who uh, have no opinions and have no feelings and have no reactions to what we see or, or what we discover, but that's completely false. We are regular people who are gathering information and after we have gathered information and checked it and made sure it's correct as, as far as we can do, we do form a judgment about what the story actually is, what, what the narrative actually is. And, um, and it's our obligation to tell that as we best understand it. Um, and sometimes that means that there is a right and a wrong side. In climate, uh, if you look at the question about Hurricane Sandy, was it caused by climate change? This was a question a lot of people were asking in the aftermath of the storm, or in fact, as the storm approached. And the answer is, well, not really, sort of ish, kind of. Uh, the, the idea is that in principle, storms like this will get stronger as the climate change changes, but there's no evidence that this was a factor here. Uh, there, uh, the storm surge was worse than it would have been because sea level is a little bit higher than it was 100 years ago. So that's a connection. But, but to, to say, yes, Hurricane Sandy was caused by climate change, it's, it's simply not supported by the facts. And so we don't do that. What we do you do is uh, use it as a teaching moment to say the best projections that we have say that storms in the Atlantic are likely to get stronger but fewer. That's the best science as of today, um, as the century progresses. Uh, we also um, say that the fact that these storms do more damage has as much to do with the fact that we've developed a lot along the shore over the past 50 years. So 30 seconds. So the simple answer is not always the correct answer. Uh, but s I wrote my first story about climate change for Time Magazine, a cover story in 1987, believe it or not. And, and actually, I wrote a story about beach erosion that same year before before sea level had risen much. Um, and at that time, the science was still equivocal. There were people who could legitimately say, we don't have proof that this is really going to happen. Um, it's plausible, but we don't know. And I had to report that, because that was the honest interpretation of the facts as they were then. Today, I'm not interested in hearing from people who say, no, climate change is not happening. It's, it's, it's all natural cycles, because that has been disproven so many times by so many scientists. There's no point. And the last thing I will say, even though I'm a few seconds over, is that uh, I use an analogy here. There is a, um, a PhD uh, immunologist at uh, Berkeley, University of California at Berkeley, who says that HIV does not cause, cause AIDS. He's on the faculty of Berkeley, eminent virologist. When I write a story about AIDS, I do not say, on the other hand, maybe it's all not true, because this guy has this theory. It's nonsense, and nobody pays attention to him, so I don't. It's the same way with people who say that climate change uh, is not caused substantially by humans. They're out there. They're, they've got PhDs. There are a few of them. I don't pay any attention. I don't feel any obligation as a reporter to be uh, even-handed. I'm objective, I, I'm, or objective in that sense. I am, uh, am open-minded. I listen, and then I write what I feel is the honest story. Okay, thank you. All right, I'd like to open up for questions. So when, before you ask a question, if you could just tell us your name and where you're from. Yes. Thank you. More, more questions like that. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. Did, did you want to record this for the microphone? OK, so sir, d could you repeat your question into the microphone so that we can track you down later and punish you for it? My question is uh, for Justin. And I wanted to know if he still moderates every, uh, every posting. Or do you have a, a group of people that do it? Or how do you do it? That was amazing. It, thank you. It, it's, 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 uh, it's just me. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot of work, but, but I see the, you know, the value in it. I, I should just say that I, w I had that same question. How is this possible? But there it is. What's your life like? Ask my girlfriend that. She uh, drives her crazy at times, believe me. 
Well, yeah, that's that's a whole other uh, separate issue, right. but uh, but it definitely is time to right. A, a revenue to model is a whole other issue. Yeah. But I, I, a question though. So now that you've got so many followers, um, there's questions of how are you going to handle the volume and uh, manage your success. But um, once upon a time, there was no there there, um, and you were probably struggling to get people to pay attention to you. And I think as a lot of people start off now as bloggers in their towns. Um, the thing that's going to determine whether or not they, their coverage matters is whether or not people tune into it. And once you get a critical mass, then it's great. Then the mayor will start being nice to you and calling you up. Exactly. But in the beginning, um, it's the opposite. So how did you get started and how would you counsel people to get started to get that critical mass? Well, this was kind of a uh, you know, overnight thing in a way. Uh, it, it kind of exploded in a matter of uh, three days during Irene. And then that you know, provided me with my coverage being objective and, and treating this as a journalist. and not necessarily as just someone who puts up anything random, and being honest and trying to tell both sides of the story, um, uh, that, that kind of um, you know, you know, pushed it forward and, and gained more credibility. And just one quick thing, the name is, is kind of, it throws you off because you see hurricane news, and you automatically think it's only about hurricanes, it's not about anything else. Well, just to make a long story short, Facebook will not allow you to change your name when you go beyond 100 likes. Right. So, <laughs> I've become stuck with that. And uh, that is actually, in a way, that obviously was tremendous to build that base during Sandy, uh, but it's still a hindrance in a way, because people search when they see, oh, hurricane news, there's no hurricane right now. So, uh, but I think that to, to keep your success and, and to keep it going, uh, you need to be credible. Uh, you, if, if you start posting stuff that's incorrect or you're spreading rumors, people are gonna turn their backs. They're not gonna follow you anymore. Mm -hmm. Just follow up on that. Sure. wasn't being honest and open. We didn't know when we were, what was going on. We mm -hmm. didn't know it was going to be that bad. The point is, I, there was a trust that was built immediately. Within those few days, you, you did it. Whatever you have, you got it. And you should, you should definitely, no, but you should definitely parlay that into something with the, the I guess, I don't want to call you legitimate, but you know, like the, the, the you know. Traditional. Traditional, sure. thank you. Sure. Because that's more credibility for you, because people in this state know you now and you have credibility because you don't just let the rumors fly. Can you be my agent? Uh, <laughs> no, but I shared you uh, uh, within those few days, my whole area, I was down in Seoul. Okay. We shared you and people were talking about you because they said this guy is just not posting nonsense. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we know what things are out, who's got what, and then of course Sandy, I wasn't nearly as bad, but you did the same thing. You, you built your credibility. Sure, and you know, I, I think just to add to that, I think I, I just want to give a shout out to, to everyone in general, uh, the contributors. Um, you would think that there would be, be a lot of um, false information floating around. And, and in a way, the, the, again, as I said, the main reason why I wasn't sleeping as much is because people were not being mean-spirited when they were posting rumors. They were just hearing things, and they wanted to, to, to tell someone. That's why I started this thing. Send it to me privately so I can get that off the main page. And it, and it worked. And I think I, I've, in, in a year and a half doing this, I, I really have not seen any blatantly false reports. It's a testament to the honesty of people. I think people at times don't give the general public uh, a lot of credit, but people are honest. In a way they're honest too is because on Facebook they're using their real name. And so I think that may be something to, to, to do with it as well. But people in general, um, they want to provide information because they would want information if they needed it as well. Yeah, I just have one question. Uh, Greg Sandler from, uh, from Wayne. Um, I guess it's mostly a question for Colleen. Um, I was intrigued by the one slide you had showed that uh, had, I think it was a yacht company of some sort in terms of being a polluter in a particular area of the state. So when you're providing information like that, what is the responsibility that the reporter or the journalist has in terms of providing information that, you know, I'm assuming in a case like that, you better be 100% true in terms of the data you have. Otherwise, I guess there could be some exposure for liability in terms of slander or something of the sort of that business that potentially has now been exposed, if you will, in that publication. Right, so, the, for, so in that case, the source of the news is the um, EPA's um, toxic release inventory. Um, so the, it's a credible source, it's the federal government. Yeah, you wouldn't want to just, you know, get a phone call from somebody saying, hey, you know, guess what, uh, this, uh, in fact, there was a story I tried to track down, it didn't, uh, 
pan out, this is while I was at the paper, where there was a, a, a toxic waste plume up in Byram, and people thought it was coming from a bus company up on, on the hill over, you know, where the, um, where the plume was, and the state DEP went in and did an investigation, but they never came up with, you know, saying definitively, yes, this is, this is where it came from. Well, you know, so, I mean, we can't, we can't say that. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, we didn't even report that this is where people have suspicions because again, you do, you know, you do open yourself up to, to that. And certainly if you're a citizen journalist and you don't have, you know, any, um, the backing of any kind of liability insurance so that if you get sued, boy, you're, you know, they can come after your house. I mean, that's, I mean, I think that's really something that you guys all have to be careful of. So yes, I would definitely only use very credible, um, very credible sources. Um, in doing something like that, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go with anything that was not um, checked. Yes, sir. In the back with the microphone. Uh, hi, I'm <coughs> Jeff Jarvis. I apologize. I was teaching, so I was late, and it's killing me that I missed your spiel, Justin. So I'll, I apologize if, I, if you, these <laughs> questions were answered. Two quick questions. One, sure. uh, the choice of the Facebook platform, and whether you feel trapped by that now. Could you build more uh, uh, if you were outside of Facebook? Would you always hold on to Facebook? Would you like Facebook Plus? That's one question. Second question, money. Uh, you're providing a valuable service to a heck of a lot of people. You're getting a large audience. Uh, have you looked at uh, how to try to um, buy some bread? Sure. Uh, that's <laughs> the second question is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a huge question, but I'll, I'll, I'll start with the first. The reason why I started with Facebook is because I, I've been using Twitter for years prior uh, to, to instituting this on Facebook in 2011. Uh, I saw I saw Twitter in a way is is not having that 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 threatening aspect that that Facebook has. Facebook, uh, especially with citizen journalism, allows you to to kind of build the story as it's happening, um, where so in the comments. Twitter, on the other hand, Twitter is is a great mechanism for breaking tool, for for breaking news, as as most people know, um, but it doesn't have that level of uh, you know interaction. Um, so that's why I saw I started with Facebook and. Unfortunately, since it's just me, the Twitter aspect is, is somewhat weak um, because all, all, all that's happening now is that when something gets posted on Facebook, it gets automatically ported over to Twitter, and then you need to click the link within there to go to Facebook. Um, so, so I see a ton of value uh, in Twitter, um, but I also see from what I'm doing to try to get the community organized and, and to report that way, having that threading uh, works uh, perfectly. The second question, boy, that's been driving me crazy for, uh, for, for a long time. Um, I, I've had a lot of people uh, approach me, um, a, a lot of, say, businesses, for example. They want to advertise. Now, it's, it's based on social media, so there are some limitations. There are actually a lot of limitations. Um, I, I've been trying to, I've been acting, I've, I've been not acting, I've, I've been trying to do this as an as a idealist because I, I see the, the value and the pure nature of media. But I also understand on the other side that we need to make money. Uh, whether it's, it's for-profit or non-profit to, to keep this, this, this mechanism uh, sustainable. So, so I have uh, you know, applied for funding um, from, from, some, uh, from some sources, uh, and uh, I've, been, I've been approached by venture capitalists to, who, have, who, have, who have some interest as well. First thing I need to do is, is to find a way to get it off social media, not entirely, but I have to have this, this, other, uh, this other area where, uh, where I can provide more information and I, I can also have, have, have room to generate uh, you know, revenue. Because Facebook, they make all the money. I provide the information and they provide, and they make the money when, when people click on, uh, on, on, on ads. So it benefits them tremendously, but obviously without Facebook, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Susan Haig with New Jersey Arts News, and thanks to all, all three of you, um, really interesting observations. I wanted to ask, um, I guess Michael, really. Um, it, seems, it's, it seems to us at New Jersey Arts News that there's a whole area of news that's missing, and that is the non-quantifiable, the non-statistics, um, especially when it comes to creativity. And there's a great creativity movement in New Jersey, and just by definition, it's very hard to, to add it up and put a, place a number on it. So, that's the, fir the first thing I'd say is, is I think there's an incredibly important part of news that is human creative stories that are not numbers based and we need more of it and in fact they're very, it kind of defines a place and I think New Jersey has a really great opportunity to do that. Um, Michael, I was just wondering because the traditional news media does seem to deal A with numbers, quantity, 
and be with issues that as soon as you mention science, it becomes an issue. And I'm just wondering if, if, if the human stories about what people are experiencing due to global warming could be a way around that, to get to be a way to push information through that, that, that the readers and the viewers understand just because you can't deny that somebody's experiencing something. So it doesn't fall into an either or or two right. sides, but just this is right. what's happening down here, this is what's happening over there. Um, yes, uh, I, let's see. How honest to be. Um, <laughs> uh, let's, not, let's not tweet about this um, at this moment. Uh, there, there's a school of, um, of journalism that, or, or a sub-school or something, um, that says that people are interested in, in people and people are interested in stories about people and, and narratives about people. And so that, and, and, and th within the climate communication community, uh, and that the most effective way to get people to care about climate is to tell stories about people who are experiencing climate change and what it is doing uh, to them. So stories about people that happen also to be about mm -hmm. their uh, experience with climate. Um, I am in that school of thought. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in reading about people, it's stories, actual stories, not charts and numbers are really, really important, but they, they're not, they don't, they inform me, but they don't in entertain me, they don't engage me, I don't, I don't identify with them. You know, what would it be like to be that number on the chart? I don't feel that way. <laughs> but, you know, what would it be like to be that farmer who's <coughs> entering the third year of drought and, and can't grow crops, and is this the way it's gonna be forever? Is the climate really, or, or water resources, things like that. People who are, are ex ex having life experiences involving uh, climate. Um, so I think those are, I think that's the best way to, to tell stories. Others believe that just the facts, hard facts, numbers, statistics, um, you know, hard news uh, is, is the way to do it. And yet a, yet a third uh, school of thought says, you've got to terrify people. You've got to tell them the world is coming to an end, you're all gonna die, and you know, get on your knees. And um, I, I'm not talking about religious uh, people, I'm talking about uh, climate, uh, people worried about climate. And so there, there are these three different ideas, and, and depending on who you're working for, uh, unless you're the boss, you are kind of forced to go along with one of those uh, ideas, those theories. And at Climate Central, we started out with the idea of telling stories. And then we got new management, and they are not interested in stories. And in fact, one of, uh, one of the editors, um, we were thinking of hiring somebody, and the editor said, um, uh, oh, we're not gonna hire her. She likes like fuzzy, warm and fuzzy stories about people. Ugh. You know, no way. So, um, so that's a long-winded answer, uh, which basically says, I think you're right, but not everybody does. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, think, I think the fact that um, stories work is evidenced by the fact that anytime you see um, a presidential debate, they don't say, you know, my program is gonna get 50,000 more people in healthcare. They'll say, there's a woman in Ohio. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, but then af after they give the anecdote, of course, the anecdotes can be wrong. Then they talk about usually backing up with some stats, and so I think there's a, a happy medium, uh, you know, a sweet spot. Two more questions. This is your grand chance. Well, I actually have one question that I was burning to ask um, Colleen. Uh, do you have any um, story suggestions? That, uh, I assume that there are some types of stories that are probably well suited to people who are operating probably at the local level, that they can get the data pretty easily, and that have been done in other places, you know, that might be a good place to start. Do you have any tips? Oh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, the, kind of the last thing I noted, which, you know, it's a little hard, I mean, you'd have to probably file an Oprah, but, um, you know, the cell phone story. We, um, I, that's another story that I started to do um, just before the daily record was, you know, sliding, actually it was sliding down really quickly. Um, 
I, I mean, I think that you know, it's the kind of thing that no one really writes about. What, what are, you know, how much money are your towns spending on things like that, on, on cell phone bills? And, and what are the, where are the calls going to? We got bills for um, one community. And I mean, I literally had a stack like this because we couldn't get them electronically. And I literally spent a summer highlighting, looking at numbers and found that, you know, there were tons of calls being made on company time, um, long calls being made for, you know, 45 minutes to an hour to places out of state um, by people who are not, you know, um, administrators or department heads. Um, the calls that were made out of the country. I mean, I think there's 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 a lot of really interesting stuff stuff you could find there. Um, look at look at salaries. You know, um, every year the administrator salaries will come out for schools. Um, what's happening with your school superintendent's budget and uh, his his salary because of the the state's cap? Um, has you know was there a deal made? And what happens when that now that contract is up? Um, you know, the police contracts. There's so much, there's just so much rich information in town hall, in budgets, uh, that I really think, you know, everybody should be just kind of digging into, into, uh, into all of that. Um, as well as, like I said, if you have, if you have um, time, look at who are, who are the polluters in town. Look at who does have, uh, you know, a, a farmland tax break. Um, I was shocked to find that there are tons of companies you know, usually what comes up are the, the celebrities, the, the Christy Whitmans, the uh, Congressman Freeling Heisens, the Congressman Runyons, they've got farmland breaks. But there are also big companies. Uh, by me, I live in Hunterdon County. Exxon has, um, you know, a huge campus in Clinton Township, and they are paying less, I think, on their, you know, 600 acres than I do on my home because they have a, prop they have a farmland assessment. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that I think people in town who have, as you know, everybody's paying really high property taxes in New Jersey would be very interested to see. Mm -hmm. And if people are interested, one uh, good source of guidance for how you can gather new data using members of your community and volunteers is in the Sustainable Jersey website. There's a community asset mapping action there that describes how to do what they call crowdsourcing, where uh, actually you send people out with um, their cell phones or cameras or laptops, and they can find information about um, brownfields or graffiti or things that need to be cleaned up or potholes and input that onto a map. And it's very simple to do, and all of a sudden, through uh, you've got a new source of data that didn't exist before, um, and everyone's paying attention to what you've got because you, you created a, a something new and a value in the information world. So. Um, so I think that's it. We're, we're out of time for this panel. Um, please join me in giving them a round of applause and thanking them for coming down. And I'll One sort of thing, back Randy. To Heather. Um, I, I actually, as part of my paying job, I, I have a, uh, a zoning board hearing that I have to leave to go testify to in, in Warren Township right now. So if anyone wants to uh, send me an email and talk more, it's my name.com. It's my website, and then you can press contact, and we'll, we can go from there. Thank you. Thank you again, guys. Um, if you're interested in learning more about data journalism, um, I suggest you all go to the New Jersey News Commons um, next Monday from 12 to 3 at Montclair State University. They're giving hands-on training. I don't know. Um, Debbie, do you want to get, Lauren, if you want to hand Debbie the microphone, just give a one minute. Oh, I'll let you give a one minute pitch. <laughs> Hi, uh, yeah. Um, John Key from WMYC, who's one of the masters of data journalism, is coming um, as part of the NJ News Commons to do some training in basic data journalism. Um, there's about eight spots left in the class. If anybody wants to come, it's open to citizen journalists and, and journalist journalists and, and anybody who's just trying to increase competence. So if you can come to me, I'll be here till the end and let me know. Or go on our website, njnewscommons.org, and just search data journalism. It'll be the first thing that comes up.